Elden Ring has a few pivotal events in its story that punctuate its fascinating timeline, key events that have all helped shape the world as it is now. The fracturing of the One Great, the War of the Giants, and the shattering of the Elden Ring to name but a few. But arguably, no event casts as large a shadow as the infamous Night of the Black Knives. On a night of wintry fog, a group of conspirators stole a fragment of the Rune of Death from Malekith. With their knives imbued by its power, these assassins murdered the demigod Godwin the Golden, and the rest is history. Yet despite these well-known facts, very little is known about the smaller details of this fateful night. When exactly did it happen? Did Rani betray her co-conspirators? Was Marika actually involved? Were other demigods murdered on the same night? In this video, we are going to unpack this event, from the formation of the conspiracy itself to the fallout, and review some fascinating and largely forgotten material from Bandai Namco's website, in an attempt to have a deeper understanding of this monumental event in the lore, who was involved, and what the true outcome actually was. At this point, I would also like to offer my thanks to Mirko, translator for Sabaka no Meiko, and Loki, author of the Abyssal Archive, both translators who offered me a lot of help in understanding some of the finer points in this video. And before we get started, remember to subscribe to the channel and like the video if you like Elden Ring lore content. Before we talk about the event itself and the build-up of the conspiracy, we need to talk about where this event sits in the general Elden Ring timeline. This event, of course, must have taken place after the Godskin Apostasy, because it is the aforementioned event that led to Malekith sealing Death's and death within his Black Blade. And of course, it is from Malekith that the conspirators of the Knight of the Black Knives would steal the Rune of Death from. Thus, the events of this night must come after the Godskin Apostasy. We also have the story trailer in which Rani narrates the events that led up to the Shattering War, and I quote Rani's narration from that trailer now. The Rune of Death was stolen, and the demigods began to fall. Starting with Godwin the Golden, Queen Marika was driven to the brink. The Shattering War ensued, a war that wrought only darkness. The way in which this is delivered seems to imply a direct chain of causality. The Night of the Black Knives happened, and as a result, it pushed Queen Marika to the brink, leading to the shattering of the Elden Ring. This is always the way I've interpreted the story trailer, and indeed, an article from Bandai Namco themselves released alongside this story trailer to help explain what we're seeing in the story trailer in December of 21, also seems to imply a direct causal link. It is important when looking at outside sources, as is the case for the story trailer, and of course the Bandai Namco article, that we make it clear that these are not canonical sources, so you are free to disregard them as you so choose, so we do need to be careful when using these types of evidence. Firstly, thanks to the work of those like Sekiro Dubey, Lance McDonald, and Zully the Witch, we know that a lot actually changed between December of 2021 which is when this article and story trailer came out, and the release in February of 2022. The story trailer isn't an in-game cinematic, and it is more like a thematic appetizer for fans a couple of months ahead of release. That being said, there is no evidence that the overarching lore surrounding the Night of the Black Knives has changed substantially with what we have in-game, and so I am more willing to lean into this idea that the intentions of the developer and publisher behind the story of the Knight of the Black Knives is still relevant to what we are seeing in the game, that this was what they conceived of the story at least of December 2021, but it would be intellectually dishonest of me if I didn't make it clear that of course this article and the story trailer to a degree are non-canonical sources. And as you can see from the parts I'm showing on the screen, there are many interesting details included in this article especially in regards to Marika, that we will return to later. But for now, let's just stick with the timeline aspect of it. The heavy emphasis in both the story trailer and the article on a causal link seems to suggest to me 
that this event took place closer to the end of Marika's reign rather than closer to the earlier Crucible and Age of Plenty eras. There's of course another similar retelling of events by an in-game NPC that lines up pretty well with the story trailer. I am referring to Sorcerer Roger, who is someone who has dedicated his life to researching this event and its fallout. When describing the importance of this event, and when it came to pass, he says the following. The misshapen corpse under Stormvale. That is a sacred relic of the Black Knives Plot, as that famed night of assassination is known. It happened during the Golden Age of the Erd Tree, long before the shattering of the Elden Ring. Someone stole a fragment of the Rune of Death from Maleketh, the Black Blade, and on a bitter night, murdered Godwin the Golden. That was the first recorded death of a demigod in all history, and it became the catalyst. Soon, the Elden Ring was smashed, and thus sprang forth the war known as the Shattering. So again, Roger reiterates the fact that this event, the Night of the Black Knives, was specifically the catalyst that would lead to the Shattering. Again, a chain of causality between this event and the Shattering. This is a sentiment backed up by Loki, who believes that the kanji that was translated as catalyst could be more closely translated as trigger, and in short believes that linguistically, the language is trying to imply that the Knight of the Black Knives is directly connected to the outcome of Marika shattering the Elden Ring. When talking about when this event took place, Rogier specifically mentions a golden age as well, and again Loki was kind enough to offer their perspective as it is written in the original Japanese. Specifically, what their interpretation of what Roger means when he says a golden age, and I quote Loki now. Prosperous age is its own term, and basically refers to what we would call a golden age. Roger is talking about the period before things fell apart, so of course that would be deemed a prosperous era of peace. So in essence, Loki believes that Roger is simply referring to a time, in general, when things were good, and before the peace was broken. And in general, during Marika's reign, we do seem to have long periods of peace, from the Godskin apostasy, really to the Night of the Black Knives when everything fell apart. And in general, if you want a greater view of the things that happened during Marika's reign, I would recommend my Elden Ring timeline video, which I will link below. There are also some other tangential pieces of evidence that may help to give us a general idea of when this took place. For example, we know that Godwin took place in the War of the Ancient Dragons, and so again, the Night of the Black Knives has to have taken place after this event. But not only that, there is some evidence, potentially, that Godwin met Mikola. For example, there is the Golden Epitaph Sword, which reads the following. A sword made to commemorate the death of Godwin the Golden, first of the demigods to die, infused with the humble prayer of a young boy, O oh brother, Lord brother, please die a true death. The sword is made to commemorate Godwin's death, so after it, and is infused with the prayer of a young boy, who most likely must be Mikola, not only because of his youthful appearance, but because of Mikola's other potential associations with Godwin and trying to grant him a true death. If you're unsure what connection I'm referring to, I am talking about Castle Saul and the NPC that can be found at the top of its battlements after defeating Commander Nile. The dialogue of this ghost NPC suggests that the denizens of the castles were looking for ways to restore the soul of soulless demigods, and in particular, Mikola's comrade. But if you want a more in-depth look at this, then I would recommend my Mikola lore video, which I will link below. Now, these are of course important things to look at when talking about a timeline, because surely, if Mikola cares so deeply about his dear brother, about Godwin's fate, 
then surely they must have had a relationship in knowing each other for such love to exist. And if we assume that to be a given, then surely the Night of the Black Knives has to have happened after Mikla was born, and thus later on in Tamarka's rule after she had married Radigan. So with all the context we've looked at and all the linguistic nuance, I do think it is most likely fair to say that this event, the Night of the Black Knives, comes later on in Marika's rule, the end of a long period of peace and prosperity. Mirko did offer a different perspective on the translation of Rogier's Golden Era, and I will quote Mirko on screen now, and essentially, Mirko suggests that linguistically, the Japanese could be translated to mean the age of prosperity, the age of plenty, therefore putting it closer to the beginning of Marika's reign, and earlier on in the timeline than many may assume. However, I do leave it for you to decide which fits more carefully with your understanding of the timeline. Regardless, all we can say definitively is that this attack must have occurred during a period of relative peace, growth and prosperity under Queen Marika's rule, between the godskin Apostle Godhunt, but before the shattering of the Elden Ring. And with that said, let us go on to assess who actually took part in this conspiracy, who they are, and how they came to become known as the Black Knife Assassins. So now we have a general idea of when, we now need to talk about the conspirators and how this conspiracy was formed. The heavy hand and muscle of this operation were of course the Black Knife Assassins themselves. These nimble and deadly warriors are described to be scions of the Eternal City by Rogier who says the following. They say the assassins who carried out the deed were scions of the Eternal City, a group entirely of women arrayed in armor of silver under cloaks which fooled the eye. The knives they wielded though, were imparted with the power of the rune of death through sinister rite. But are also simultaneously described as Numen by the Black Knives armor set, which reads, the assassins that carried out the deeds of the Knight of the Black Knives were all women and rumoured to be Numen, who had close ties with Marika herself. I think there's little value in me in going over this in depth once again, but here are the main general ties to why the Nox are essentially an offshoot Numen tribe. And if you'd like to hear a more in-depth explanation of that, then I would recommend my video on the Eternal Cities, which I will link below. What is more interesting is that I believe we can specifically track the development of these assassins and how they tie into the Eternal Cities and the Numen themselves. The armor set describes the assassins as all women. They are also extremely nimble warriors, and fittingly, there is also an all-female nimble warrior class found within the Eternal City, the Swordstress. In prior videos I have suggested that maybe the Black Knife Assassins were Swordstresses themselves. I think there is more nuance to be had here as we will dig in deeper and I have refined my own opinions on it as I've dug deeper into this very topic, but it is still fitting that culturally the Nox have a precedent for nimble female warriors. This is where I want to return to the term Scions of the Eternal Cities, as mentioned by Rogier. Scion means a descendant, usually used in reference to a notable bloodline. Loki was able to provide further insight into who these women may be, and he translated Rogier's dialogue in the following manner. I told you before about the Night of the Black Knives conspiracy. The perpetrators are said to be assassins who are descendants of the Eternal Capital. Then Loki would go on to tie this to a dialogue that we've looked at on the channel before, Gowrie's one regarding Celia's ties to the Eternal Cities, and I again quote Loki now, which ties into this, As promised, I shall teach you about the lost sorceries of Celia, descendant of the Eternal. And this is the same term for descendant used 
in both dialogues and both in regards to descending from the Eternal Cities. This is also a subject we have talked about in my Eternal Cities lore video and others, that the Selians are indeed descendants of the Nox as well, and it's therefore fascinating to me that Loki has linguistically tied these two references of two different groups together, the Black Knife Assassins and the Selians referred to in the exact same manner. However, the potential link between Celia and the Assassins is also found within the lore. One of the other defining features of the Assassins themselves are of course their cloaks, that fool the eye, a fact that is reflected in gameplay by the Assassins who are essentially invisible to us, unless we are using the Sentry Torch, and even when we can see them, their cloaks seem to warp the light around them. So what is this technology or magic, and how are the Eternal Cities able to craft these extraordinary pieces of armour? Well again, I think if we look at the culture and sorcery of Celia, we can get the answer. As we have already mentioned, Gowry directly ties Celia as an offshoot colony of Noxian descent, calling them descendants of the Eternal. As thanks, I vow to impart to you my knowledge of the lost sorceries of the Celians, descendants of the Eternal. But even without Gowry, the player would be able to tell these ties through visual and implicit storytelling. The most obvious, of course, is the crypt chair found in the rear of Celia, guarded by none other than a Noxian monk and swordstress. Indeed, the Celian throne is integrated into the Celian court of arms, and given how iconic the crypt chairs are to Noxian society, it really shows how important the ties to the Eternal Cities are to this small town. Now, the architecture of Celia itself is different from the architecture of the Eternal Cities, but they are close enough that you could imagine them being built by Noxian offshoot. Indeed, the architecture of the lower regions of Leyendale matches that of Celia and Ordina as well, and credit to tarnished archaeologist who makes this connection in his video on Leyendale. And given that Celia is connected to the Nox, and therefore the Numen, it's a logical conclusion that this lower Leyendale is also connected to the same tribe, Marika's tribe in Marika's city. Tarnished archaeologist also brings attention to the main gate of Leyendale, and how it essentially leads to nowhere, suggesting that it must have been built with this Numen settlement, Lower Leyendale, in mind. I leave it to tarnished archaeologists to explain the implication this has for the Eternal Cities underground, some directly below where this gap between the wall and the Lower Leyendale settlement is, as that is not the subject of this video. I'm just highlighting it because it shows the deep connections between the Numen and the Nox and their history with Marika and the lands between, that even in the heart of Leyendale, we can see traces of the Nox's heritage and how important they are to Marika and the royal family. A fact that is even more stark when you consider that the signature floral patterns on the leaden windows of Celia are the same patterns on the very gates of Leyendale itself. Yet to be clear, the Selians are certainly descended from the Nox, as is said by Gary explicitly, and the fact they are called Scions by Rogier, which again means descendants. And so while Lower Leyendale most likely precedes the Eternal Cities and shares an architectural style with Celia, Celia most clearly comes after the establishment of the Eternal Cities and the Nox, but the point in highlighting the connections of architecture between Celia and Lower Lane Dell is not necessarily to put it in the same day as Lower Lane Dell, but to highlight the connection and heritage that Celia and the Nox and the Numen share. In turn, this raises questions about Ordina Liturgical Town that also shares the same architectural design, but we will get there near the end of the video. Then, of course, there is the Celian spell. Night Maiden's Mist, one of the night sorceries of Celia, and the description of this spell reads as follows. One of the night sorceries of Celia, Town of Sorcery. Below Celia, the eternal city of Nocron sleeps. This sorcery originates from the maiden of that place. This is of course one of the greatest ties between the two. Firstly, it is a Celian night sorcery, and yet, it originates from one of the Night Maidens of Nocron. Night Maidens, of course, being the highest ranking members in Noxian society that we are aware of. Indeed, when we fight 
Night Maidens and Nocron and Noxtella, they quite often use this technique and spell against us, again stressing the connection between Celia and its sorceries to the Nox. We can get a feel for what these night sorceries are all about and why they were developed by reading the description of Ambush Shard, which reads the following. One of the night sorceries of Celia, Town of Sorcery. The Celian sorcerers were assassins, and it is said that they often hunted their fellows. So this is a school of sorcery dedicated to assassination. It is about obfuscation and killing, which is reflected in the fact that when you use these spells, they fool the eyes of opponents, who will not try to react or dodge, as they may well do for regular spells. However, what is more important to this current discussion when talking about the Assassins of the Black Knives is the spell known as Unseen Form, which reads as follows. One of the night sorceries of Celia, Town of Sorcery, makes the caster semi-invisible, while on horseback effect extends to cover the mount. This sorcery can be cast while in motion. The Selian assassins considered every option that aided their dirty work. So here we have specifically a sorcery that makes one invisible, developed by a town that specialises in assassination. The description of the black knife armour makes it clear that there is a power in the veils that fool the eye, and I think it is more than likely that these knight sorceries will have been employed to empower these specialised veils, so that they could fool the eye, much like the Unseen Form spell. I want to briefly speak on the design of the armour itself. According to the description of the Black Knife armour set, it was forged to make no sound, and again we could attribute that to the night magic of the Selians, or perhaps the tight and sophisticated scale design. However, what I'm more interested in is the iconography. There seems to be a large focus on feathers, both on the lower part of the cuirass and the teal feathers found on the shoulder joints. When trying to explain this, fortunately for us, there is another group of assassins who employ similar iconography, the Ravenmount assassins. The armour set of these read as follows. A ritual implement for transforming into a death bird, if only by imitation. We are birds of prey, bringers of death. As I discussed at length in my Death Birds lore video, Death Birds in the lands between are literal symbols of death, much as crows or ravens are to us in the real world. The Raven Mount imitated the Death Birds to show that they are bringers of death. Given that the Black Knife Assassins are also assassins, my presumption is that the design of this armour is meant to employ the same sort of symbolism, so I think it's clear that the work developed in Celia, both in regards to training assassins and in developing spells that help obscure the assassins from their targets, were used to help equip and train the assassins that would go on to be known as the Black Knife Assassins, really cementing this Celian link. So with those deep connections to Celia in mind, let us once again return to specifically the women who would become the Black Knife Assassins. Straight up, the most obvious answer to me, given all we've looked at, is that these assassins are from Celia themselves. They are assassins who were trained by the town and are from there. This would quite easily tick all the boxes we know about the assassins. They are related to the Numen. They are Celian trained in assassination. It's a town that developed invisibility sorcery. And it is a town of descendants of the Eternal City much as the assassins themselves are described. I'd be certainly happy with this, and we can move on, however we could potentially go deeper if we examine another signature element of the assassins, the black knife weapons themselves, because they have another tie in game. Rani states that she forged the blade through fearsome right. I stole a fragment of the rune of death, and used it to forge the god slaying black knives through fearsome right. I did it all. And shortly we will discuss where Rani may have got this occult knowledge from. However, despite Rani using the term forged, the actual description of the black knife reads slightly differently. It reads as follows. A ritual performed on 
the oddly misshapen blade, imbued it with the power of the stolen rune of death. So the ritual was performed on the blade, meaning presumably this ritual was performed on a mundane knife that was forged the traditional way. And if we are looking at a base template for what type of knife may have been used in this ritual, we should look no further than the Blade of Calling. For those who don't know, the Blade of Calling is a very similar size and shape to the Black Knife one, except for the protruding aspects and it isn't black. But more importantly, the weapon art for the Blade of Calling, Blade of Gold, is basically a golden version of the Blade of Death weapon art that the Black Knife uses. This is also the blade, the Blade of Calling, wielded by Melina when we summon her for the more goat fight, and she uses the exact same moveset as a Black Knife Assassin. So this begs the question, who is Melina, and how can she inform us on who these assassins may be? So this is heavy speculation, but I want to try and tie together everything we know about Celia and Melina and her moveset and the Blade of Calling. It is heavily implied that Melina is a child of Marika, and yet she shares a combat style with these Numen kin, who have descended from the Noxian split of the Numen tribe. Taking Celia as an example, despite the place retaining heavy ties to the Nox, these are kind of hidden, such as the Noxian throne being hidden right at the back of Celia, and I'm sure many don't actually know in the world of Elden Ring that the Nox are related to the Celians. And in a lot of ways, the Celians have reintegrated with surface society. Lusat is a great example of this, a Celian native who was once Grand Master of Rhea Lucaria's Academy and founder of the Elevenus Conspectus. And thus, if Lusat is able to integrate into normal society despite being of Noxian descent, is it possible that we can explain the closeness of the Black Knife Assassins in a similar manner, that these are Celian women who are reintegrated into Marika's court? bound through ties of kinship. I'm saying all this because of the implications of what is said in the Black Knife Assassin armor set in regards to closeness of these women to Marika, and in turn how that can help us explain the curious links between Melina and the Black Knife Assassins and the Blade of Calling with the Black Knife. And does this mean close in blood relation or close as in familial or friendship? And for now I'm disregarding the idea that it means close that they were her co-conspirators as I will deal with that later. But for now I wanted to get to the truth of what is being said here when it says close. And so once again I turn to Loki, who was able to provide this appraisal of the original Japanese. And I now quote his translation of the Black Knife armor set and appraisal. It is said that the assassins, who were the perpetrators of the Knight of the Conspiracy, are all women and according to one theory, were visitors close to Marika. Then Loki goes on to explain, close in the psychological sense, not in terms of dealings. So what Loki is trying to get across here is that the original Japanese, in his opinion, is only trying to convey that these women were close psychologically to Marika. Close in terms of psychology, so friendship, kinship, or companionship and nothing else. And again, this all makes sense without going any deeper if you consider their blood ties, that they all come from the Numen tribe ultimately. So in general, if these Numen were close to Marika and close to the court, perhaps they would have been trained in the same manner as Melina, another woman of the court, and armed with the same blades. In European courts, royal women often surrounded themselves with noble women, who would serve as their advisors, confidants, and companions, known as ladies-in-waiting. And perhaps this explains their proximity to Melina, and why they would share a combat style and armament, that these Numen women, possibly from Celia, acted as women of the court, and will have interacted and been around at the same time as Melina. That is of course wild speculation, but it's something that could explain the proximity of Melina to these women, and why they share similar combat styles. And so my final word on my speculation on who the Black Knife Assassins were specifically is that they were probably Salians and they were Numen that were probably known to Marika in some capacity. And that is all we are able to say with any certainty. And again, we will return to the idea that Marika was involved later and why I do not believe that it is the case. 
when it comes to the assassins as characters and named people, we do have two named members of the leadership, Alecto and her daughter Tyche. Both have ancient Greek origins, Alecto meaning unceasing anger, who was one of the Furies in Greek mythology, which indeed feels fitting for an assassin who brings vengeance for her people, the Nox, against the gods, and we will talk more about the Nox's motivation in the next chapter. Tyche is a letter swapped spelling of an ancient Greek word that represents the Greek deity of fortune, which is why I'm pronouncing it that way by the way, and I find this somewhat ironic given her ultimate fate. However, when we look at the way Greeks viewed fortune, there is a little more here. Fortune could sometimes be seen as a force of uncaring reversals of fate and arbitrary violence, which is fitting given the fate of the Nox and Godwin himself. What is interesting is that the Bandai Namco site that I've cited frequently already names the Black Knife Assassins as a Foul Covenant, and given Rani's connection to the occult in the Dark Moon, perhaps Rani corrupted them with her beliefs and thus they made a covenant between them. This of course brings us to the main conspirator, Rani herself. Whatever you think about the timeline we have discussed, it is an immutable fact that Rani was involved. I see. Quite the sleuth, aren't we? Indeed, I am the witch, Rani. I stole a fragment of the Rune of Death and used it to forge the god-slaying black knives through fearsome rite. I did it all. Now I have a fairly good idea who performed the rite upon the blade. The person who orchestrated the Knight of the Black Knives. Lunar Princess Rani. One of the children born to King Consort Radigan and his first wife, Ronala. Demigod and sister to General Radan and Praetor Rikard. Hers was the name I discovered in the imprint. These dialogues both suggest that Rani was not only a conspirator, but in fact the orchestrator of the entire conspiracy. And this certainly makes sense given that Rani wanted something very specific out of this event, and we will look at that in the following chapters. At this stage, Rani would still have her original Empyrean body with red hair, as we can see from its remains. She would have been a princess with some privilege, and thus unsurprising she would have had the resources and influence to organise such an operation. It also seems that Rani's magic was necessary, as she claims it was she who imparted the power of death upon the knives through fearsome right. This also seems backed up by the knife print that we give to Rogier who can detect her hand in the ritual which imbued the knives with their power. The knives they wielded though, were imparted with the power of the rune of death through sinister right. Please, I beg of you, lend me the knife print for a time. I'd love nothing more than to tease out its secrets. Though only a fragment, a very specific ritual had to be performed to impart the power of the rune of death. Traces of the one who performed the rite are sure to remain in the imprint. The term used by Rani, fearsome right, smacks of occultism and it makes sense that Rani would have this type of knowledge due to her association with the Dark Moon. Rani's Dark Moon spell reads as follows. This moon was encountered by a young Rani, led by the hand of her mother Renala. What she beheld was cold, dark, and veiled in occult mystery. So Rani's Dark Moon, specifically, is tied to occult mystery, and it is no doubt via the Dark Moon that Rani will have learned or gained the skills necessary to imbue the Black Knives with death. But there is another player in the story of the Dark Moon, the Snowy Crone, Rani's secret mentor. We learn of the Crone via certain spells, such as Freezing Mist, which reads as follows. The Snowy Crone taught the young Rani to fear the Dark Moon as she imparted her cold sorcery, and via the Snow Witch set, which reads, once worn by the snowy crone who the young sorcery encountered deep in the woods, she was a witch and well versed in cold sorceries. The old witch was Rani's secret mentor. Witches, the term that is used to describe this woman here, are generally associated with dark occult or blood magic, and Rani in turn would become known as Rani the Witch. So while it is probable that a lot of Rani's powers are tied to the power of the Dark Moon, 
I believe that it was the crone, the Snow Witch, who told her how to wield them and taught her occult magic. As such, it is most likely from the crone that Rani learned of the fearsome rite that would allow her to forge the Black Knives. Rani's brother Rikard also seems to have been tangentially involved, as we learn via the Blasphemous Claw, which reads, On the night of the dire plot, Rani rewarded Praetor Rikard with these traces. Should the coming trespass one day transpire, they would serve as a last resort foil, allowing Rikard to challenge Malekith the Black Blade. So the English here is a little confusing as to why Rani is actually giving these items to Rikard. So again, Loki has been kind enough to provide a clearer translation of what is being conveyed here. And I quote their translation of the Blasphemous Claw now. Rock fragment engraved with a scale of the Rune of Death can divert the power of the Black Sword. On the night of the conspiracy, Praetor Rikar received a scale as a reward from Rani. As the trump card to challenge Malekith the Black Sword, the Black Beast, who is destined death, when blasphemy someday comes. Now, blasphemy is a subject we talked about in great detail in my Rikard lore video. In essence, blasphemy means the turning against the Erd Tree, Rikard turning against his own kin, and to take their power for his own. It is his rebellion. That is what the Day of Blasphemy is. So from Loki's translation, it seems as though Rani was giving Rikard this fragment so that he can challenge the gods in his time of blasphemy. He must have already shared his blasphemous ideals with his sister. That is why she trusts him enough to let him know about the conspiracy and her involvement in it by handing him these shards. She's just causing more trouble for the Erd Tree Order. She has just armed a future enemy of the Erd Tree with a great weapon against their most powerful member. So in essence, Rikard is not really involved. Rather, he and his sister have both shared their ideals and they both share a hatred for the Erd Tree and its order. And thus, she's given a weapon to her brother just in the hopes that he can one day cause some trouble. But now that we've discussed Rani's involvement, her involvement with making the blades and organizing the conspiracy in general, we now have to talk about the big elephant in the room, Marika, and why I believe she was not involved. So this brings us to the Marika question. Early on in the game's life cycle, many believed that Marika had a hand in the Night of the Black Knives, and many familiar with the channel, or people who follow me on Twitter, will know I am very cynical of that theory as it has never felt right to me, and I have included it for completeness in certain videos, but it's never been the one that I've held to be the truth. However, again for completeness, let's just go over why this is such a popular theory. It is mainly anchored by one central item, the Black Knife armor set, which states that the assassins had close ties to Marika. People have taken this to mean that Marika was tied to the conspiracy, that she had close ties to them through the planning of this conspiracy, and they believe it is reinforced by her perceived callousness towards her children. In Marika's own words, hear me, demigods, my children, beloved, make of thyselves that which he desire, be it a lord, be it a god, but should ye fail to become aught at all, ye will be forsaken, amounting only to sacrifices. If you'd want to see a video in more detail that discusses this theory, I'd recommend my good friend Ashen Hollow's lore video on this very subject. According to proponents of this theory, Marika's motivation for doing this, for killing her own son, is a way of rebelling against the greater will by killing her own child. Yeah, it's never really chimed true to me and it just feels a little contrived, like they believe she's playing some kind of 4D chess. And really, the main person that gets something out of the Night of the Black Knives is Rani, who specifically has it planned in a certain, particular, precise way for her benefit, as we will look at in the next chapter. So to jam Marika's ego and motives and 4D chess on top of Rani's plans doesn't feel quite right. Emotionally, I also think a lot of people view Marika 
as some kind of Machiavellian schemer, and therefore readily accept this theory despite its flaws. Now at the beginning of this video I quoted an article from Bandai Namco themselves, an article from December which explains the intent of what is being conveyed to us in the story trailer that also was released in December. Of course, we do need to bear in mind that the article is pre-release, it's December of 21, and some details did change thanks to the work of Sekiro Dubi and Lance McDonald. But it is only two months, and I reckon the broad details of the story trailer are generally correct, so I will quote the relevant passage from the article now. One grim night in the depths of winter, a flock of unknown assassins stole across the lands between. In a coetaneous attack, this foul covenant snuffed out the lives of many of the God Queen's kin throughout the Empire, too numerous and too scattered for her godly protection to save. The assassins' targets were multifold, but none was as devastating a loss to the Eternal Queen as that of Godwin the Golden. After his death, the Elden Ring was somehow shattered and the order of the world broke with it. So Bandai painted a picture of a god who wanted to protect her children from this attack, not involved, and that Godwin's death caused her a great deal of grief. So to those that believe that Marka did have a hand in the assassination, at the very least need to acknowledge this as a major flaw in their argument, a article from the publisher themselves that isn't in-game so can't be subject to the usual unreliable narrator arguments that we can sometimes get when discussing the finer points of the lore. Bandai Namco will have no doubt consulted with From Software before releasing this article, and no doubt got the finer details of what is being conveyed here from From Software. And I think it is fair to say that FromSoft will certainly have greenlit the article, especially given how much they care about their lore and worlds. The reality of the Black Knife Assassin armour description to me is just a case of slightly awkward English that can be read in different ways, because while many people have read it as definitive proof of Marika's involvement, I simply have never read it that way because of the language used. And indeed this also does seem to be the opinion of Loki, who tweeted the following in a Twitter debate regarding this exact subject. To clarify, Marika's close ties with the assassins isn't in terms of dealings, but with familiarity slash emotional affinity, kinship you could say, which makes sense given their blood ties. Whether that is alluding to more than just coming from the same tribe, no comment at this time. And that is exactly how I reviewed it. That there is a blood kinship tie and in fact this makes the tragedy all the more because Marika and her children are betrayed by those of their blood, those closest to them. So to me, and as directly stated by Bandai Namco, Marika is in fact a secondary victim of the event, someone who loses her son, rather than some Machiavellian mastermind who is playing 4D chess and kills her son in some bizarre convoluted plan to hit back at the Elden Ring but then she shatters the Elden Ring anyway, rendering this scheme moot. For if Marika really was wanting to hit back against the Greater Well all this time in some clever plot, why not just shatter the Elden Ring straight away, as this is the real blow to the Greater Well's authority. The event is still important to Marika, even though she isn't involved. As the story trailer says, this event pushed Queen Marika to the brink, and as we have looked at in the previous chapters, in regards to the linguistics involved thanks to Loki, it is the trigger for the shattering of the Elden Ring, so it is still important. It's just that it causes someone who has lost her son to break the foundations of the world that she rules. So in summary, the causal link between the Knight of the Black Knives and the shattering of the Elden Ring most makes sense if the tragedy of the Knight of the Black Knives caused Marika in her grief to shatter the Elden Ring, combined with the linguistics shown by Loki and the Bandai Namco page that straight up exonerates her, I think we can safely put Marika's involvement to rest. With that being said, and the conspirators defined, it is time we discuss the motivations of those involved and why they were motivated to take part in such a dangerous conspiracy. 
Let's look at the motivations of the Black Knife assassins themselves, why they were part of this conspiracy, and what they expected to achieve from it. The first could be pretty simple, that they are simply Rani's co-conspirators, and they believed initially in her mission to become the Lord of Night and bring about the Age of Stars. There's of course another more general explanation, is that they are kin to the Nox and there's an underlying resentment for the Greater Will and its representatives held by Nox society. The armour sets of the Nox of course make it clear that the Nox are where they are, banished underground, because of past grudges against the Greater Will and its proponents, and we get evidence via the Finger Slayer Blade that they have acted against the Greater Will before. So I think the motivation for this group could be fairly straightforward. Revenge. Revenge for their kin's banishment, and a chance to overthrow the gods, put them to the sword, and bring about the Age of Stars. Either of those two fit. However, either way, I believe that Rani later betrayed the Black Knife assassins following the Knight of the Black Knives, and there are two possible reasons for this as far as I see it. Explanation A is that Rani deceived them as to the true purpose of the attack, and used them to achieve her real goal. While the assassins believed that this was a strike to bring down the gods, to kill them all, Rani uses it as an opportunity to perform a ritual and free herself from her flesh, and she kept the truth of this purpose from the assassins, and used them as tools. Explanation B is that the assassins were fully aware and on board with the true purpose, but Rani still turned on them following the attack, and imprisoned their leader to cover up her involvement, and left the rest of the assassins hung out to dry at the mercy of Lanedale guards and forces. And so at this point I should probably explain why I think Rani deceived and betrayed the Black Knife assassins, and mainly I think my evidence comes from environmental storytelling. First of all, near the conclusion of Rani's quest, there seems to be a coordinated attack against her people, and while I once thought that Rani was still in control of the Black Knives and she ordered this attack to cover her tracks, I don't think this quite fits given she does seem to show a lot of care for Eiji and Blythe, even telling the player to tell Eiji and Blythe that she loves them when she departs after we defeat the last Baleful Shadow. So no, even though she is ruthless, I don't think she had Blythe and E.G. killed. So what happens here? E.G. is killed, and surrounding him are the bodies of Black Knife assassins, and he is burning in the black flame of the Godskins. The potential connection between the Godskin apostles and the Black Knife assassins is something I've ruminated on before in my Eternal Cities lore video, so I shan't go over it again in huge detail. But regardless, the main takeaway here is that Black Knife assassins attacked E.G. and killed him. Continuing with this Ludo narrative, when we three Blythe from the Evergeal, he expresses fear for Rani's safety and races to be by her side. When we next see him, he is indeed where Rani should be, but he is in a bad way, maddened and surrounded by the corpses of Black Knife assassins and to me it is implied that these assassins were here for Rani, given their location right outside her tower. Unfortunately for them, Rani has already departed through Rena's rise, and they ended up meeting Blythe's blade instead. It shouldn't be too far of a stretch to believe that Rani may have people out for her blood, as we do have definitive confirmation that there has already been an attempt on her life. We learn of this via the Black Wolf Mask, a mask that perfectly mimics Blythe's appearance and its description reads as follows. Relic of an assassin who assumed the guise of Rani the Witch's loyal shadow. The likeness is striking. Now the implication here is that someone took on the guise of Blythe in order to get close to Rani and essentially kill her. In prior videos I have speculated that this assassin may have been Darawil, 
This is of course the Bloodhound Knight that you can kill in the Everjail and Limgrave and Blythe is looking for. But ultimately whether or not it's Darwell is irrelevant because either way it would certainly fit the narrative we are talking about of the Black Knife assassins attacking Rani. Perhaps this was the Black Knife's more subtle first attempt at seeking retribution, hiring an assassin or having one of their own to try and get close to Rani through subterfuge. But when it failed, they instead resorted to this strike team of Black Knives that Blythe ultimately kills. There is also the fact that Rani asks us to retrieve the Finger Slayer Blade from Nokron, but the Knots clearly aren't willing to give her the knife, hence why we have to break into the city, kill the Knox that are there, and steal the treasure from them. If the two factions were allied, and both ultimately wanting to bring about an Age of Stars, why wouldn't the Knox readily give Rani the tool that she needs? And why are the Black Knife assassins, scions of the Nox themselves, and apparently Rani's allies, attacking Rani's people? Well again, I think all of these things can be explained if Rani had betrayed them, either by deceiving them to the true purpose of the mission and using them as disposable tools, or she betrayed them in the aftermath either way. We will talk about this more in the aftermath chapter, but consider why Electo, ringleader of the Black Knives themselves, is imprisoned in an Everjail in Rani's territory, in Moonlight Altar itself. To me, the Ludo narrative is clear. The Black Knife assassins and Rani are no longer allies. The Black Knife assassins have a grudge against Rani and Rani has imprisoned Alecto. But with that said, let us now go into Rani's motives a bit more and what she wanted exactly to get out of the Knight of the Black Knives and why she wanted it. Rani's true end goal is more than simple assassination, as we can hear it from her directly. I was once an Empyrean of the demigods. Only I, Mikola, and Melania could claim that title. Each of us was chosen by our own two fingers as a candidate to succeed Queen Marika, to become the new god of the coming age, which is when I received Blythe in the form of a vassal tailored for an Empyrean, but I would not acquiesce to the Two Fingers. I stole the Rune of Death, slew mine own Empyrean flesh, casting it away. I would not be controlled by that thing. Rani's death in body was not an unwanted consequence of the attack. Rather, it was the purpose of the attack in Rani's mind. She wanted Red, of her Empyrean flesh. She resented being controlled and tied to the greater will through her own body, tied to a fate she did not choose, a disposable pawn for the greater will. These are very understandable motives on a personal level for Rani, but we also have to remember that Rani will have fallen under the influence of the Snowy Crone and the Dark Moon, and no doubt they would have been encouraging her to take steps towards an Age of Stars and ascend as the Lord of Night. But it would do her plan no good if she was destroyed totally, obliterated in both body and soul just to sever her connection to the greater will. And so she needed a plan, to rid herself of her body but remain in spirit and soul. What she needed was a totem to take the soul death consequence of destined death while she was freed from her flesh prison. We will look at the specifics as to how this ritual worked in the next chapter, but it is important to understand Rani's true reason for being involved in this conspiracy. Not to overthrow the gods, not yet at least, but specifically to begin to sever the bonds between herself, her two fingers, and the greater will. By being an Empyrean, she is tied by her body to the two fingers and the greater will, unable to make her own fate. And again, we will later see her complete this plan by killing the Baleful Shadows and then finally slaying her two fingers, finally severing that connection and confirming that this has been Rani's long-held intention to all of her schemes. So with the stage set, the motives of both main parties clear, let us talk about the specifics of the night itself. That night of wintry fog, the night of the Black Knaves. As the story trailer tells us, it was on a night 
of wintry fog that the rune of death was stolen and this was the first part of the scheme. And so the first question may be, how were they able to achieve this? How did they steal a fragment of the rune of death given that Malekith is such a powerful being? Well, the truth is pretty simple. Malekith was far more careless in the past than he is now. When we meet Malekith in our story, he is very reticent to even reveal his real identity, pretending to be someone known as Garank, and he has the Black Blade, the sword that is imbued with death and death, hidden within his very flesh. However, this is a precaution that essentially came too late, as we learn the following from the Black Blade item description. After a fragment of death was stolen on that fateful night, Malekith bound the blade within his own flesh, such that none might ever rob death again. Rob death again and after that fateful night, meaning that prior to this, Malekith did not hide his black blade within his flesh, and indeed there is evidence that he wielded it quite openly and publicly. For example, Malekith's armour set reads the following. Malekith, Queen Marika's loyal half-brother, bore a blade imbued with death and death, and there was not one demigod who did not fear him. Champions knew what was at stake. Indeed, that is what made them champions. The fact that Malekith is widely feared and everyone knew what was stake if they stood against him suggests that Malekith was just openly wielding the Black Blade, imbued with death. He was Marika's Grim Reaper, a symbol of her power, and a subtle reminder that in a world where death is confined, Marika's Black Blade was the only one capable of slaying a demigod. Yet it was this arrogance that evidently gave the conspirators their opportunity, and Rani seems to claim that she specifically stole the Rune of Death personally. As she says in her speech, I stole a fragment of the Rune of Death and used it to forge the god-slaying black knives through fearsome right. I did it all. I stole a fragment of the Rune of Death. I did it all. Meaning she did all the parts she just confessed to, stole the Rune and forged the black slaying knives. In fairness, this does also make quite a bit of sense when you think about it. Rani would be in the best position to get close to Malekith and steal a fragment of the Rune of Death. She was royalty, and given the fact her involvement seems hidden for a long time, at this stage she would have just been part of the royal family beyond suspicion with a lot of access. Then using the knowledge learned from the Snowy Crone or the Dark Moon, Rani imparted the power of death through a fearsome occult rite. Now we spoke earlier on the knives themselves and how Rani no doubt used the Blade of Calling weapon as a template and imbued these blades with the power of death. And in essence, this is why the Black Knife acts as like a corrupted version of the Blade of Calling. And it brings us to an aspect of the blades we haven't yet mentioned, their unusual shape. In the description of the blade itself, it is described as oddly misshapen, and indeed, I believe it was the ritual itself that morphed the blade to take on this form, because despite it being misshapen, it is not random. All the blades are uniform, and I believe it is taking the form of either the Rune of Death itself, or the half wound wheel of the centipede. You see, the actual form and shape of the Rune of Death appears to hold some power because of the shape itself, as we will see when we discuss how Rani and Godwin had the runes literally carved into them. And I believe that the blades have been warped by the power of Death and Death to take on the form of the Rune of Death. Once the blades were forged, the assassins headed out to attack their victims, and thanks to their special garb that we've already discussed, they would have been able to reach their victims undetected and unseen. The sentry's torch may shine a light, pun intended, on how effective this was and how defenceless the demigods were. It reads as follows, Torch given to protectors of the Erd Tree, its flames are bestowed with a special incantation which allows the bear to see assassins cloaked in veils, furnished on behalf of the Erd Tree and the grace given lord, such that a knight of the black knives will never come again. 
So this implies that on the actual night of the Black Knives, the authorities and guards had no defence and no answer to these hidden veils. How could they if they'd never experienced them before? And they really had no idea of numerous assassins simply slipping past them and reaching their targets unaccosted. Now, at this juncture, I want to return to the Bandai Namco article that describes the event, as it does give some details as to how the event might have played out. In-game, we are only directly referenced to one victim of the Knight of the Black Knives, and that is Godwin. Yet this article suggests that more than one was killed during this attack. And again, I will read the relevant passage. In a coetaneous attack, this foul covenant snuffed out the lives of many of the God Queen's kin throughout the Empire, too numerous, too scattered for her godly protection to save. The Assassin's targets were multifold, but none was as devastating a loss to the Eternal Queen as that of Godwin the Golden. This of course ties up with the story trailer as you'd expect, given this article accompanied it. In the trailer, Rani narrates the events of the Night of the Black Knives, and again I will quote her narration now. And the demigods began to fall, starting with Godwin the Golden. The fact she says starting with Godwin the Golden suggests that many demigods were to die in this event, and that Godwin was just the first. Now this does tie up with some interesting mentions in the game that could give the claim some validity. Firstly, in the intro to the game itself, it says something of a similar nature. And in the night of the Black Knives, Godwin the Golden was first to perish. The first to perish, again, meaning that more than one demigod was killed in that night, and that Godwin was just the first. So we can imagine all the assassins spreading out the lands between, as Bandai Namco describes it, a coetaneous attack, to strike at different targets simultaneously. This also supports the idea that the aim of the assassins could have been to generally strike against the gods, to cause as much damage to the regime as possible, and that Rani obscured the real truth of the operation to them. Now, how does this help explain the other soulless demigods that we find in the mausoleums throughout the Lands Between? I think it is meant to explain them, that these are the soulless demigods, that the other kin of Marika that died in this attack were the soulless demigods that we now see in the mausoleums. There are some difficulties when it comes to the specific of soullessness, but we will talk about that at the end of the chapter. But in general, let's just accept that more than one demigod was slain during the attack, and these may well be the demigods found in the wandering mausoleums. Let us talk about the killing of Godwin now, as it is the pivotal moment of this whole event and whole subject. Firstly, when it comes to the location of where it took place, it almost certainly took place in Laying Dell, given that Taiki's ashes describe a flight from the royal capital after she slew Godwin the Golden, showing not only that Electo and Taiki were directly involved in Godwin's murder, but this murder took place in the royal capital of Laying Dell. Given how this scene is almost tragedian in nature, it would make sense thematically if this happened at the heart of the Erdtree Empire right in Lane Dell, that the assassins slipped past the guard right into Godwin's personal chambers in the heart of Lane Dell. Given that we see Godwin partially dressed in the intro slides and in the story trailer as he's being murdered, I imagine that they caught Godwin unawares and unprepared, and given that he is mighty enough a god to have defeated Fortisax, this would certainly be the prudent way to kill him. Yet the assassins did not merely stab him to death, his death was far more ritualistic in nature, and we can already get hints of this in the opening cinematic. You can see he's being held in place by two assassins, while a third is carving a very specific shape into their back. We can learn more about this carving via the curse mark of death, an item pulled from Rani's original body which also has a carving in it. This item reads as follows, curse mark carved into the discarded flesh of Rani the Witch, also known as the Half-Wheel Wound of the Centipede. The curse mark was carved at the moment of death of the first demigod, and should have taken the shape of a circle. However, two demigods perished at the same time, 
breaking the curse mark into two half wheels. Rani was the first of the demigods whose flesh perished, while the Prince of Death perished in soul alone. So this gives us an insight into the specifics of Rani's plan, and how it worked, and what happened to Godwin. Firstly, it does mention that the two curse marks, the one on Rani's back, which we can still physically see, and the one carved onto Godwin, were physically carved. The carving of this mark upon flesh apparently gives power to the rune itself. This brings death to the bearer of the rune, the person whose flesh this is carved upon. In this case, however, Rani used this ritual for her own means, to split the effects of death, to only take half and put the other half on Godwin. She used Godwin as a totem to take the death of soul part, while she merely took the death of body part. And this is what is meant by the part that says, this curse mark was carved at the moment of the death of the first demigod and should have taken the shape of a circle. However, two demigods perished at the same time, breaking the curse mark into two half wheels. This suggests that at the exact moment Godwin was having the half wound carved into his, Rani was also having the other half carved into her back. The effect of this was that it made a full wheel of death, splitting the effects between the two. This paints a pretty dramatic picture of Rani atop the Liurnian Tower that wintry night, having a half wound carved into her back, while Electo and her cohorts did the same to Godwin at the exact same moment in Leyendale. This was Rani's plan, the purpose for her involvement in the conspiracy. It freed her soul from her Empyrean flesh. The fact that the curse mark item description describes her flesh as discarded shows that this was a purposeful design. She wanted rid of this flesh. Yet the price was high, and even Rani probably didn't see the extent of the consequences of her actions. For not only did it condemn a being to a soulless living death, which must be a hellish state of existence, given what we see of Godwin and his new body, but it also resulted in the spread of the death route and the rise of those who live in death, starting a brand new cycle of suffering all over again. Again, these are points I would like to remind people of when they see Rani as some kind of hero. She isn't a villain, but she ruthlessly condemns Godwin for her own aims to an eternity of suffering, and her recklessness gives rise to the pitiful beings known as those who live in death, and through no fault of their own, these beings will just be hounded and hunted by those of the Golden Order. This also brings us back to the issue of the soulless demigods I mentioned earlier. Godwin was the first to die, and he was killed in soul only to benefit Rani's plan. So why would these other demigods, if we're presuming the ones in the mausoleum were the ones killed in the Night of the Black Knives alongside Godwin, be described as soulless if it was only Godwin who was killed in this ritualistic manner? Well, there are a few ways to explain this. The first one is a bit of a case of Occam's Razor. The simplest explanation being that the other soulless demigods are dead in soul, but also in body. The curse mark of death says that the rune should have taken the form of a wheel should have, meaning perhaps the other assassination attempts went ahead as normal and the whole rune of death was carved into the back of the targets, killing them both in body and in spirit rather than just soul. I think this does make sense. There is a distinction between being dead and being dead and soulless, and it would still give a reason that their fate would be mourned by the likes of those at Castle Saul. It is because they are without souls, unable to pass on properly, not that they are just dead. There are a few other alternative explanations for this, but I don't want to get into a rabbit hole about this, as this is probably a subject for another video, but I think it's fair to say that the soulless demigods found in the mausoleums are meant to represent, probably, the others that were killed that night. And now with the devastating effects of the night itself discussed, let us move on to the aftermath of what happened following this event. In the immediate aftermath of Godwin's death, we learn of the assassins fleeing from the scene of the crime, and we learn this via Taiki's ashes, which read as follows. Taiki was one of the assassins who, on the night of the plot, imbued her black blade 
with the Rune of Death and slew Godwin the Golden. She was the daughter of the Black Knife ringleader Alecto and was killed protecting her mother during their flight from the royal capital. So a flight from the capital suggests that despite slipping into the capital undetected, that their escape was far more eventful. Indeed, I get the general impression that Rani basically hung the assassins out to dry after the attack. We find them scattered throughout the lands between, hiding in caves, dungeons, and the capital itself, giving the impression of a panicked flight from Lane Dell as they were hunted and killed by the authorities. Indeed, if one looks carefully at the assassin found in the death-touched catacombs, we can see that they are greatly wounded, armour rent and bloodied. Elsewhere, the assassins are hiding, and their resting demeanour gives off the impression of a fugitive, exhausted and hounded to the fringes of the lands between, and no doubt many were hunted and killed in the hours, days and months following the assassination. Later on, we learn via the sentry torch that the grace-given lord, Morgoth, would equip his forces with sentry torches, meaning that the Black Knife assassins would never have the power over the Lanedale capital that they once did, and perhaps these tools were even used by Lanedale forces to hunt down the remaining Black Knives in years to come. And while I have no doubt that the Lanedale forces fell upon the assassins, I suspect that Rani is responsible for Alecto and Taiki's final fate. Whether carrying forces killed Taiki and arrested Alecto, or whether Alecto fled to Rani with her daughter in her arms being killed by Lanedale forces, it is clear to me that either way, Rani imprisoned Alecto following the assassination, and conveniently, her involvement in the conspiracy would be hidden for years until Rogier uncovered the truth finally. Rani was probably content to let people believe she too was a victim of the slaughter, and I would guess that she did not return in her new form until some time later, perhaps when she returned to claim a great rune after the shattering, but that's just speculation of course. Meanwhile we learn that Godwin was of course buried at the roots of the great tree, and from him would spread the death route throughout the lands between, bringing those who live in death. This event is something I look at in great detail in my Godwin lore video, but in short, this is the biggest consequence of this fateful night. It exposed the flaws in the Deathless Golden Order, and began a cycle of persecution that would lead to Goldmask examining the nature of the Golden Order and what went wrong here. The wrongness of this act, the slaughter of Rani's own kin, and to deny him a true death, is reflected in the corruption of the world. Godwin's growths and tendrils reach even to Faramazula and the deepest caverns, it is a rot born of a terrible crime, and the breaking of fate. It is Kigai. Then of course came the shattering of the Elden Ring, and the great suffering of the Shattering War that followed. I think we have shown fairly conclusive evidence that it was the trauma of this night and the loss of her child that drove Marika to shatter the Elden Ring. Bereft and disenchanted with the Golden Order she once served, an order that couldn't even save her son, from a horrific, endless fate, and so she brought a hammer down in a fateful blow that would change the world. As a sort of epilogue, there is something else I want to touch upon, Ordina Liturgical Town, and the Black Knife Assassins found here. I feel it is no coincidence that Ordina has the exact same architecture as Celia, and we have strong evidence that the Assassins themselves are Celian, and we here find in Ordina plenty of Black Knife Assassins, one of the most concentrated locations for them in the entire game. To me it is very possible that a group of Assassins fled here and have built a new township, following the architecture of where they are probably from. Perhaps they built this under the aegis of a new forgiving lord, one they still serve in their exile by protecting access to his lands for any who would want to access the Halig Tree. Smo here, I would just like to wish you all a wonderful holiday period. For those who celebrate it, Christmas will have already passed by the time this video goes out, but I would still like to take a moment to thank you all for watching this video and supporting me throughout 2022. And with that said, we now look to a new year tarnished, and I wish you all a wonderful new year, no matter what you celebrate it,
or when you celebrate it, and that 2023 is fantastic to you all and your families. Take care and have a wonderful night, and I will see you in the Death Touch Catacombs. Happy holidays, everyone.